Morning, church. It is an absolute privilege to share with you this morning. The sermon's always been an integral part of the life of Enfield, I think, um, for my time being here, but only as integral as all the other parts, and I think hearing about people serving in other ways this morning and all the other programs that we have going, this is just one part of that, and I'm very privileged to do that, but it's only one small part of what we do. But I pray this morning that it will shape a little bit about how we operate this week. If you've been with us for, or for, with me the last few times um, I've spoken, we've been going through this bit of a journey about God's perspective towards us, what it looks like for Jesus' kingdom and his rule and his reign. And we started off by looking at his relationship and his attitude towards us, the fact that he didn't stay distant, but that he came close, that he drew close to us, that he didn't stay off in heaven but that he came and broke through those barriers and that he offered the ultimate sacrifice and tore through that curtain, that veil, got rid of the guardians, the cherubim between us and him and that he poured his spirit so that we would have absolute access to him. And so today we're going to look at desire. What do you desire? What do you want (laughs) <laughs> looking out of the room, I can imagine there's a diverse range of wants and needs. If you're a bit younger, maybe you've been looking at Instagram this week and you've uh, seen that latest pair of Nikes or you're looking at that next thing online that you want to purchase. Maybe you're at the other end of the spectrum, maybe you just want the best for your grandkids and your kids. Maybe you want a nice retirement. I'm not sure. I'm interested though. What do you desire? What do you want? And see, the reality that God has come to us and broken down all the barriers between us is that now we must change our desires, that that does change what we can want, what we can desire. So we're going to be looking at Galatians 5 this morning, and I want to focus on what we desire, but then also we're going to talk about prayer And I want to prepare you because I want to have a bit of a time of prayer together a bit later in the service. And I guess for some of you, maybe prayer together is a new idea or something that doesn't happen very often. But I want to prepare you that today I want to give you a space to pray with each other and that we want to sort of end the sermon and the the time of worship this morning praying together. So a bit of a heads up, all right, because that might be a little bit of a new idea for some of you and some of you might thrive off it. So I'm looking forward to it. But let's look at the uh, scripture from this morning. So Galatians 5, starting at 13. And you're very welcome to follow along, but it's up on the screen as well. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh, but rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command... Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. So, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not have to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. People that live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That a life like this is not living under the rule and reign of Christ. And that while some of those things for you may be completely foreign, we'll have a look at maybe some more detail about that in a minute. But the fact is that if this is the fruit 
of our life, if this is the outworking of our time and our energy and our mind, then we're not acknowledging life, uh, Christ in our lives. We're not walking alongside him and acknowledging his presence with us. And so I want to acknowledge Christ's presence with us right now. It's not this airy-fairy concept that sometimes he comes and sometimes he goes. He is with us now and always. He is in our lives, in our hearts, and he is with us as we sit here together and, and focus on him and praise him. That Christ is with us and it is our job to actually acknowledge that and to be aware of that. We often think the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, this triune way of explaining God. And if we look at that word spirit, we can actually understand it more to be this idea of air, of movement, of breath. That we have Father, we have Son, and we have our breath. We have our action. We have every word that comes out of our mouth. We have every Um, every time we do something in the world, that we can understand that Father, Son, and action, that this is God's action in the world. It is coming from us, especially us as the church, and us as Enfield Baptists, but us as the collective church as well. Now, I want to look at Eugene Peterson's understanding of this verse. It's a little bit different gives a few more legs to maybe the understanding of uh, what some of these fruits of actually living distant from the Spirit are. So let's have a look at them. It's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless and cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants. (laughs) Come on, who's out there who's got those? (laughs) I know I do. A brutal temper and impotence to love or an importance to be loved or to love, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncomfortable addictions, ugly parodies of community, I could go on. Is there anything out there that resonates with you from that list? Is there anything that you go, yeah, I have that. I have that desire sometimes. I want you to know that's okay if you have that desire. We're not looking at, we're trying to look at today that this is the, we're looking at the fruits of our work. But if you have some of those desires, what we need to do is acknowledge them. But all of these fruits are the result of selfish inward desires, ones that focus on us first and foremost. When we look at the the fruits of the Spirit, we're looking at ones that are outwardly focused on others, not just us and not just what we might gain from putting energy into that sort of project or that sort of thing or that sort of time or that sort of relationship or that purchase. We're looking at what do we actually, what can we actually give to others. And so as soon as you start to focus on yourself, this is not walking with the Spirit. This is not walking alongside the fact that Christ is Lord. We're looking after ourselves. We're looking after what we know and what we think. So keep thinking about that. What do you desire? And is it something for yourself or is it something for others? Is it for the church and for our community? Or are you simply living for what you need and what you want? Is it for your benefit or for our benefit? 
So Sarah and I, the last couple of weeks, have had to buy a new car. Um, and if anyone's bought a new car in the last little while, there's a few options. You've got a few different uh, opportunities that you can pursue. You could spend a whole lot of money, you can get a loan, you could um, just look at the savings you have and kind of just try and buy a nice used car, many used cars on the market. What do you think? What do you think I desired off the bat? <laughs> I was looking at nice, big, comfy cars. I was looking at, with, looking at the power of the engine, right, how big it is, if I get my bike on top. I was looking at maybe what people would perceive me to, to kind of look like as I turned up. Was I successful? Did I know what, you know, kind of how to live a good life? You know, was it going to be reliable, that sort of thing? Oh, you know, kind of that's important, I suppose. Was it going to be cheap to maintain? Ah, oh, it's not as good as if it was fast. <laughs> My desire was for myself. Nothing in that list was for anyone else. I didn't even mention Sarah or Emma in that list. <laughs> I was looking for me. My desire was for me. And so, in talking to Sarah and working through that, we ended up buying a cheap car, and it had, it's not fast at all. It's one of the slowest cars we've ever owned. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, but it's fantastic. It'll be great. So when we talk about desire, I think we're talking about that a little bit. You know, we buy things and we pursue things a little bit. But I think we can go a whole lot deeper than that. And so... The other thing that I desire, beyond a car, has been sleep. <laughs> Emma is wonderful. She's absolutely beautiful. But alongside her is a lack of sleep, and I've desired sleep. I've wanted sleep so I can function better, so I don't, I don't feel kind of so just gross all the time, so I feel like I can have lots of energy, so I can perform better at work, so I can be present. But again, think about that list that I've just given you. It's all about me. And I really struggled getting up at night. I really struggled to actually, uh, you know, sacrifice that sleep. I couldn't work out why. You know, I had this beautiful daughter, but I found it so hard to actually be able to give that up. You know, all I got the sense was, was, well, the fact that I wanted sleep was the problem. I wanted me. I had a desire for myself, what I needed was to think about how it impacted others. And as soon as I acknowledge the fact that, yes, I want sleep, that before Emma I could get my 10 hours a night, fantastic. <laughs> now I couldn't. The fact when I owned it, when I acknowledged that, and then I said, you know what? Actually, this is about wanting to make sure Sarah feels loved, that she actually gets more sleep that it's about equipping Emma with the skills to be able to soothe herself and settle herself, that this is about us as a family. This isn't about me. This isn't about how much sleep and how I need to be restored, but this is about us. This is about others. And as soon as that happened, you can ask Sarah, it was kind of amazing. I had this real amazing ability to go to work and perform, come home and actually look after Emma most of the night and then go and do it again. It's incredible, the work of the Spirit in that moment. As soon as I was able to acknowledge the fact, in actual fact, I couldn't do this alone. That by ourselves, all we can do is live a lonely life. That without the Spirit, there's only one thing we can do, and that's our own thing. That with the Spirit, we can live together, we can live empowered lives that concern others. What we have to do is actually admit that, in actual fact, living a life with the Spirit has a big damaging effect on our pride. And that our pride can often get in the way. The fact that we think maybe we can control our lives, maybe we can, we can control our energy, maybe we can control what we're trying to do. But in actual fact, the Spirit has to do a hard work on our pride. And that we have to acknowledge that, no, we cannot live alone, that we cannot do this thing by ourselves, that the fruits of that are all selfish and all dysfunctional. But when we acknowledge that, yes, we actually need God in our lives each and every moment, each and every day, when we start to pursue walking alongside Him, then we can actually live together. Then we can actually do something worthwhile. Then we can participate in Christ's kingdom. 
And this is the same for our selfish desires as well. That, you know what, they're not innately bad. You're going to have them. We're going to have them. But if we acknowledge them, and if we share them, oh my gosh, confronting. If we actually share them with someone else, if you are in a small group and you actually share, oh my gosh, I really desire this. I really want this. And I know it's not actually benefiting others. It's only for me. That you are one step along the way in actually walking with the Spirit. And so we want to focus a little bit on prayer today. And I want to give us a few examples of how we might pray. And towards the end of the service, maybe you'll choose one of these to pray with each other, with someone else, or with yourself. With God, obviously, (laughs) together. Um, But I want to look at a couple of examples of prayers that maybe you can carry with you. And so this first one, using Scripture to pray. You don't have to kind of invent prayers sometimes. I think sometimes it's kind of hard to come up with a a lovely, eloquent prayer on the spot, but there's nothing wrong with praying from Scripture. So let's pray this. Now, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all people. Oh my gosh, if you came and said that to me when I turned up on a Sunday, or if you saw me during the week and you just prayed that as we left, that would make a huge difference. So think about that as an example. Think about how you might be praying for one another. Or, and now may the God of peace equip you with everything good that you may do to his will, working with you in which is pleasing and, and in his sight through Jesus Christ. Well then, if you're looking for something to pray by yourself, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and put on the right spirit within me. Put on a new spirit within me. Sorry, I need my glasses on to read that last, that race screen. <laughs> Create in me a new spirit. I can't do this alone. So think about that. Think about these, and maybe you want to write them down. Maybe you want to come up with them. Um, come up with a, some sort of poster for your office or for your toilet door. Some of you probably already got that. Pray these things. Take them through your week. This is a prayer that has been with me since Bible college, actually. My first year, we're looking at some of broad church history, and as a part of each lecture, we would actually, we'd pray together, and this was one of them, and it stuck with me. Um, It's been on my, in my office, or my desk, or wherever I've worked, um, and I've had it on my phone. I've carried this with me all the time, and this has made a massive impact in my life. And this is from St. Augustine of Hippo, one of the church fathers. And it's, it's just, a, and just a simple prayer. It's, it's nothing particularly profound about the words beyond the fact that the heart behind it is so amazing. So, may I pray this with you. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. And guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. And praying this on the way to work, memorizing it, has made a huge difference in my life. And continually praying will make a big difference in your life as well. Prayer is the only way that we can acknowledge the fact that we're, we are not alone in this, that we are, have full access to Christ and that we can do this together. So if we acknowledge and we pray, then we must trust We must actually trust that our behavior, that our fruits will actually be of the Spirit. We don't need to focus on that list. We don't have to have that list and be like, oh, I've done that today. Oh my gosh, you know, I had that desire today. No, not at all. But we must trust in the fact that the Spirit of the Lord is with us and He will change how we act. He will change our desires and our fruits. 
Romans 6, 14 says, sin will, have no, will no longer have dominion over us, that we are living in the Spirit, and that sin no longer controls us, no longer has power over us if we are with the Spirit, if we are walking alongside God. So we must trust, we must place our trust in Christ. Then, of course, we've got to do something, right? We can't just sit around and pretend that everything is going all right, but we also can't live out of an attitude of fear that we might do the wrong thing. No, we must trust, and then we must act, and we must live as if we are living a spiritual life. We must live as if we actually do have that power that is promised to us. And so we must do something. But this is not the first step. Acknowledging and praying and trusting is first. If we act first, then that is a work of the flesh. That is actually not of the Spirit. And so we must act, and we must act after we've done the groundwork. We must act after we have done the prayer. We must act after we have acknowledged. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. A person who has acknowledged this helplessness, prayed for God's enablement to do right, confidently and can move forward in the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. We can have confidence that Christ is living inside us. And then we thank. It's that famous story of Christ, Jesus saying that it is not me, but it is God, the Father, who does good. And it's the same for us. So when you get together on Sunday, when you get together in your small groups, thank Christ for what he's done in your life that week. Have an attitude of thankfulness for all of the good that you may have done as you walk alongside the Spirit, when you become aware more, when you actually sit in an attitude of gratitude, when you actually sit in a posture of thankfulness, you'll become more and more aware of what the Spirit is doing in you and in others. So I encourage you, spend time thanking, thanking the Lord for what He's been doing in your life and in your brothers and sisters as the church. Spend time thanking the Lord and it will become more and more apparent all the wonderful things that he's done. Now those, those prayers are up again for us to have a look at. And I wonder if we can have this, a bit of an attitude today of prayer together. And so you're sitting together, most of you, and if you're sitting alone, I encourage that if someone is sitting alone, make sure you go and approach them, be proactive in this space. Whether, it's f- whether you choose one of these prayers or pray just generally together, but pray that the Spirit will fill you. Maybe you want to acknowledge a desire that you have someone here. Remember, there's nothing wrong with that desire. Acknowledge it and pray that the Spirit will fill you and that your eyes will be fixed on Christ. So I want you to spend some time to get today, and I'll ask um, Lynn if you can play a little bit of music and spend a bit of time together. So get together. Maybe you have to move your chairs. I know that we said don't move the chairs, but <laughs> get together. <laughs> Let's pray together. Let's sit with each other in this, and whether you're praying for someone else or you're praying for yourself, Let's spend some time together. Um, I'll be available at the front, and John will be available as well, and anyone else. Let's, let's pray together, all right? take away from um, people's time together so feel free to continue your prayer together and um, bring it back together at the end of the song if you like I 
that if we live by the Spirit, then also let us walk by the Spirit. That as you leave today, may you feel empowered to walk by the Spirit. That we don't have to live by our selfish desire, that we don't have to live by works of the flesh, that we can live as if Christ is with us, that Christ is living in our lives. And that I hope that you can get some empowerment together. That acknowledgement of that only happens through communion together, through fellowship. So I, I hope that you can find time to pray with one another on a Sunday, but during the week as well. Write down a prayer if you need to. Come up with, pray through scripture. Pray with one another. And, and live life with that realization that you are with Christ, that you're walking alongside him and his spirit. As we go into the last song today, I, I really encourage you to continue your prayer at the end of the service. And if you'd like to come and, and receive prayer from someone, definitely come and see me at the front. John will be here, Lynn and the rest of the band and in, any of the other leaders. Let's pray together. Let's really feel this sense of uplifting and, and being filled with the Spirit. Now may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all people.